So you guys, I'm sure recall, we had a whole national conversation about quote unquote anti-Semitism on campus and Jewish students potentially being made to feel or reality being unsafe in connection with pro-Palestine protests and encampments that sprung up on a variety of college campuses. One of those was at UCLA, where after the fact, it was documented pretty clearly that all the violence was very one-sided, was on the side of the pro-Israeli counter-protesters, numerous um, journalistic organizations, including the LA Times, documented that pretty closely, and video evidence uh, bore that out as well. CNN also did extraordinary coverage there. We have joining us this morning extraordinary guest, Salam al Mariadi, who is president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, who met with a variety of public officials in the wake of those violent counter-protests to find out where the concern lies, if they were going to conduct investigations, and he joins us now. Great to have you, sir. Good Thank to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Yeah, of course. So talk to us about your interest in what unfolded at UCLA and some of the meetings you were able to have. I attended the encampment. It was peaceful. Uh, I met a lot of students, a lot of Jewish students, uh, Muslim students, a lot of non-religious students. It, it was an array uh, that you saw there, and I, I was inspired by it, and it was peaceful. And in fact, uh, a, Princeton, a Princeton study, uh, Bridging the Divide Initiative, showed that 95% uh, of the encampments are peaceful, of the 1,000 that they assessed. Um, and so when I met with officials and they were concerned about violence from these encampments, I said, these are peaceful uh, gatherings. Mm -hmm. They're protesting in the great student tradition. When I met with Eric Holder some years back, he said he occupied a building when he was Mm. in college. Mm. So that was different though, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. yeah. <laughs> not, not, not this situation, right? right? Um, and so we see the double standards. And then um, I have attended college football games. And if you're concerned about disorderly conduct and vandalism and harassment, well, are we gonna be canceling football games uh, because of our concern? Of course not. Mm. So that's how ridiculous this argument is that there's concern about violence. And if there was violence, as you said, it was the violence against the students. It was the violence by bringing in the police uh, to dismantle the encampments. Uh, and so we talked to officials about that. And when I met with uh, the attorney general and the FBI director, the concern there was, um, you know, they're looking at violent extremism uh, and how foreign actors can use these public gatherings to attack Americans. And I said, it already happened. It happened on the night of April 30th mm -hmm. against the student protesters, against the pro-Palestinian uh, student uh, encampment. And what are you doing about that? So they promised that they would look into it, that there should be an investigation. Why did law enforcement step back and stand by watching the assault uh, on the pro-Palestinian uh, protesters? And so this was Attorney General Merrick Garland that you were speaking to, and uh, you're talking about the, you know, the counter protests director. at UCLA, which, you know, again, documented there were hours that these assaults were occurring in which the police did absolutely nothing. Yes. The next day, the police come in and they arrest the largely peaceful pro-Palestinian um, side. And so what was the response from Garland uh, when you, you know, press for an investigation into what had occurred? He said he would look into it. The FBI director said he would look into it. Uh, we received communications from, uh, the, um, from their offices uh, that there might be an investigation happening, but nothing is official, of course. And we just have to keep pressing the issue. In fact, I'm meeting today with the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Christian Clark, uh, on the same matter. So we're gonna get a, a report from them and to see where we are with the situation. Um, but we just have to keep pressing. Uh, just like we have to keep pressing for prosecution of the January 6th uh, uh, coup against our country uh, at the US Capitol, we have to press uh, here for an investigation of law enforcement and exactly who uh, these culprits were that instigated violence against the students. Hmm. Um, and right now, as of now, there's only been one arrest. Right. Uh, and even with Los Angeles Police Department, they said they didn't have enough resources to investigate. And we called that nonsense. Well, tell, so, yeah, so tell us about, you were talking previously with us about some of the meetings that you've had with public officials. I'm yeah. curious from your end, what is it like, how much can you see very clearly that there is external pressure on these individuals to not, let's say, they definitely would have acted differently, as you said, let's say the January 6th investigation or any of that, uh, in response to some of this uh, protest violence that we saw. A, a violence against the protesters. How has their difference in tone and all of that come through to you and the evidence of external pressure on them? Well, I can't tell you exactly mm -hmm. what 
evidence there is, but we know it's there. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this. But you can see it in their, you know, in their yeah. response. Like, their tell tone. us about that. Yeah. In their tone. Um, and um, they're, they're sort of uh, trying to console us that, yes, it was terrible what happened. And we said, we don't need sympathy. We need action. Uh, we need you to look into what's happening here. You know, you ha you've had Los Angeles police uh, um, department officers go to Israel and pose with IDF uh, forces mm -hmm. next to the bombs that were gonna go kill Palestinians. And we said, what kind of infiltration or influence is there within our law enforcement by the Israeli Defense Forces? We mm -hmm. need you to investigate that as well. And so we've called on the LAPD commission, um, police commission to, to look into that. Um, and, and I hope that something will come out of it. But again, we just have to keep pressing and keep advocating. I've been doing this for 40 years. When I started, um, way before your time, um, uh, the first case that I was involved in was called the LA-8. And what happened was, it was the agency at that time was called the INS, Immigration Natural Naturalization mm -hmm. Service, uh, instead of DHS. And they were looking at Palestinians who were distributing communist literature, hmm. using a McCarthy era law, the McCarran-Walter Act. And of course it was ridiculous. It took 20 years to vindicate those individuals. Wow. But yeah. these kind, this kind of McCarthyism wow. is coming back. Uh, and it's coming back with a force. Um, I, I think the pro-Israel groups, the hardliners uh, uh, from that side are using everything to pressure those officials that you're uh, referring to, mm -hmm. Sagar, and, and, and really silencing, silencing them. And while they come to us with sympathy, they really can't do anything because they know that the other side is ready to clobber them if they do take action. So it is a bit of a political game, unfortunately, yeah. but we feel that there's, there's, more, there's a growing support. In fact, for the first time, um, an LA City Councilwoman, uh, Nithya Rahman, finally sponsored a resolution for a ceasefire in the LA City mm. Council. Mm. So we'll see where that goes. So and, they, and they also passed a resolution 15 to nothing in LA City to investigate LAPD for what happened on April 30th. Got it. So the, the mayor of LA now is Karen Bass. You met with yes. her as well. I mean, she's positioned herself as a relatively progressive uh, Democrat. And what was that meaning like? And how much is your sense that, you know, we talk a lot about APAC and the influence that uh, their money and their lobbying has on, you know, all sorts of races. They've threatened, I think, $100 million in their war chest to defeat candidates that, in their view, are insufficiently pro-Israel. How much does that loom over these conversations that you're having with politicians? Like I said, I, we know it exists. Uh, it doesn't come out in these conversations, of course. But the main concern is that they're worried about the reaction uh, that they're gonna get if they come out in support of these students. Um, and the school officials say the same thing, that they, they come to us and say, you know, it's not our fault. It's really the Department of Education that's being influenced to come in. And uh, every time there's a pro-Palestinian event happening on campus, they call for an investigation. Then I go to the Department of Education and say, hey, the school officials are complaining about you. And they said, it has nothing to do with us. It's the school officials that are being pressured by the pro-Israel group. So everybody is pointing the finger mm, to, everybody, to everybody else, else right mm -hmm. now. Uh, and and we, we know that game. Uh, we've been around the block uh, a couple of times. But at, at, as I said, it's really about continuing our advocacy. And we really appreciate shows like this that oh, for you. the first time, the public is seeing the truth. That was my question too, is you've yeah. obviously been involved in this for a long time, presumably you've been meeting with Democratic lawmakers. This may be like, what, what has this been, experience been like for you to watch them change a lot of their tune that you previously may have seen sympathy and uh, do, you know, whenever it was Republicans doing it, they were willing to decry it. But this time now that they're in power, what has it been like to watch some of these people who you presumably know well, even meetings with them for a long time, just completely shift you know, post October 7th? Well, it starts with the president himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't believe it uh, when he says that I'm a Zionist. And I said, well, then how can he be our president? Mm. You don't represent us then. Mm. Um, so he met with Palestinians. He changed his tone. I believe that the protests are forcing him to change his rhetoric. It hasn't changed any action yet. Mm. Uh, with other lawmakers that we've met, uh, we met with, for example, Rohana yeah. yesterday. Uh, he came to our conference and spoke. Um, it, 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 it is a change because 20 years ago, we didn't see 30 lawmakers say we are supporting a ceasefire. Now mm. we're finally seeing that. It, the last time I saw a lawmaker actually call out Israel was Bob Dole <laughs> in the 80s when he said, oh, we should stop sending arms That's to right, Israel. That's right, I remember that. Right? Yeah. 
That was the last yeah. time. And then in yeah. between that, nothing. There was yeah. pure silence. <laughs> so now we're finally coming back to some law, lawmakers having some backbone and saying, if we care about American national security interests, this is not helping. This is hurting. Um, and so we see these 30. I hope that it grows. We even see some Republicans now beginning to question uh, what's happening in, in Gaza and, and, and blind support for Israel. Yeah, there are a few libertarian voices out there. Uh, Bob Dole vindicated, though. Mm-hmm. Glad to Yeah, <laughs> hey, Bob. Um, we wanted to get your thoughts, too, on uh, another news event that I thought you would find interesting. Let's put this up on the screen. This is really wild. So this is from the AP. After publishing an article critical of Israel, Columbia Law Review's website is shut down by the board. Let me read a little bit of this. Student editors at the Columbia Law Review say they were pressured by the journal's board of directors to halt publication of an academic article written by a Palestinian human rights lawyer that accuses Israel of committing genocide in Gaza and upholding an apartheid regime. When the editors refused the request and published that piece Monday morning anyway, the board, which is made up of faculty and alumni from Columbia University's law school, shut down the law review's website entirely. It remained offline Tuesday evening, a static homepage informing visitors the domain is under maintenance. Of course, that irony here is probably no one would have really paid attention to this article. Mm -hmm. The student editors went ahead and published it separately at a permanent link that couldn't be taken down, and it's probably gotten way more attention than it ever would have if they just let it be published. But what do you make of this extraordinary effort at censorship of, you know, a pro-Palestinian view? Well, it's like what they tried to do with Esna Tabessum at USC. They canceled her speech, so instead of talking— She was the valedictorian valedictorian who was meant to speech, and then they canceled the whole commencement, right? Canceled the whole thing. And so with Esna now, instead of speaking to 60,000 people, she's speaking to millions of people. And now this article, which basically saying that we need a new legal construct for Palestinians, it's not just about apartheid or occupation, that doesn't fit. Let us look to what's called the Nakba, the catastrophe that happened in 1948 and has continued to this day as a legal construct, right? Mm. And so by shutting this down, by this kind of censorship, now this is gonna get more traction. Mm. Um, and more people will go and read it and look to uh, not only why there's censor- censorship, but what is this all about? You know, I've been involved with groups, not involved with, but people have monitored students um, by groups called Campus Watch. Uh, it's their form of lawfare uh, against these students. Um, and Campus Watch is a, is a pro-Israel uh, website that says that these, these students are anti-Semitic. I was called anti-Semitic. You know, I was appointed to the Congressional Commission for Terrorism in 1998 by Richard Gephardt. Hmm. The ADL, the American Jewish Committee, the Conference of uh, Jewish Presidents all lobbied to rescind the nomination. Hmm. Wow. Um, the New York Times headline of that was, uh, Gephardt bows to Jews' anger hmm. um, for that. And so we've, We know that this is happening, it's gonna continue to happen uh, until the establishment gets the message. Uh, And the establishment still uh, has not received that message that this is, um, this is a violation of our First Amendment. So we have, we're now coming out with the Bureau for Academic Freedom uh, to, to organize around this issue, to defend the First Amendment rights of our students, to defend the First Amendment of our country. Mm -hmm. Um, We're the ones now that are at the center uh, of this issue. And and so it will help these students and and really say, if we're really about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, then this this censorship has got to stop, especially in public universities. Hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. I think it's important to point out too that even as this particular article, because it got a headline, it got a lot of attention, it got a lot of eyeballs, that the censorship effort didn't work. But you will have many people who don't speak out who don't write the articles that they would have, who don't publish the articles that they would have because they don't have the stomach for it, right? They don't want to be under scrutiny. They don't want to be have a, a truck driving around their college campus with their face on it, et cetera. Right. So while this individual effort maybe failed, backfired, strides and effect, the overall chilling effect is still incredibly important. So what yeah. is some of the work that you'll be doing uh, at the Bureau of Academic Freedom and where can people find out more about what you're up to? You go to our website, Muslim Public Affairs Council, mpac.org, and we're going to launch it this week or, or within the next week. Um, and the main issue is to expose um, this kind of chilling effect, this kind of censorship, this kind of intimidation uh, against our students. Um, and to provide support for them, whether it's legal support, political support, community support. um, We need to to, uh, be there at the forefront. 
And to show that this is, you know, what these student protesters are doing is part of an American campus tradition. Mm. We saw that in Vietnam. We saw that for civil rights. We saw that against uh, apartheid. This is nothing new in terms of the student tradition where students are leading us uh, because everybody else is politically shackled in Washington mm. uh, from speaking out. They're speaking uh, the conscience of our country and we have to support them. So the Bureau of Academic Freedom is, is, is objective is to end this intimidation. It's gonna be a long battle. I've been doing this you know, now going on 36 years um, and it may take you know, more decades for us to see a resolution to this conflict uh, but the Bureau of Academic Freedom is aimed to resolving mm. uh, this and, and really defend the First Amendment. Mm. Um, Salam, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Good My to pleasure. see you, sir. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you so Absolutely. much. <laughs> Appreciate the go. time. Thank you. All right. We will see you guys later. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.